Good morning. morning. I'm going to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Oktoberfest. You might have seen there's a lot of people in the congregation who have seemingly uh, developed a new hairstyle. So all those with the new hairstyle, please stand up. That's Pearl and Kate in the back, I mean, you know, and we will have our, our lead uh, Oktoberfest uh, 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 spokesperson to come forward and tell us what's going on. Good morning. Good morning. We're all excited about today. Uh, we are having our Oktoberfest um, after worship. Please join us for a wonderful um, fall theme uh, luncheon. We have a lot of different items. There's um, the menu is inside your bulletin, and it has a little bit of a German twist um, with the uh, influence. Um, so please join us. Uh, all the florines are all going to be uh, florines are all going to be serving you lunch afterwards. So please stop and enjoy. Uh, the luncheon with us. Now, now is the time you yodel. You're going to yodel now, right? Yodel. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other announcements? Uh, we have a session meeting this coming uh, Tuesday at seven o'clock. It's going to be by Zoom, and so all session members, please uh, look for the link. We will not be having Bible study this week on Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday because I have some classes I have to attend throughout the week and some preparation I need to do. But we will resume. Uh, we'll obviously have uh, next Sunday at 8.45, uh, Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis 1, chapter 3, much of what we're studying now. And then on uh, Tuesday, uh, Monday, uh, two, uh, Monday evening, then Tuesday morning, and Thursday morning, we have Bible study as well. You should be getting links, so please join us in Zoom. Right now, we're having some technical difficulties on making it a hybrid, so we'll be uh, by Zoom alone, but hopefully that's going to get fixed in the next couple of, uh, hopefully this week, and then I'll let you know next week uh, if it's going to, we're going to do the hybrid again. So hopefully we can, but uh, it's going to be Zoom from now on until you hear from me. Any other announcements? We have our minute for stewardship that will uh, that will uh, come from uh, Belinda. So, but I see Rich is uh, making an announcement. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, if you could, if the session members, I see the uh, books for next week are not out yet. So, if you could ask the session members if they could have their last month's book, so that when we talk about the finances, they can be looking at what I'm looking at. Okay, is there a chance, Rich, uh, just quickly, can you, you'd be having it on your computer, right? Uh, yes. And so maybe we'll just uh, give you share and then you can show it to everybody. Okay, we'll but if that. if that doesn't work, okay. please have your okay. uh, last Super month's duper. book. Thank you, Rich. Any other announcements? Yes, uh, Doreen. Or Helga, I think that's your name today, right? Helga. I do not dance. Uh, just a, a, a quick announcement. The women at church, ladies of lift, are going to the uh, Red Lobster on Wednesday at 1130. All the women at church are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Then I'd like to invite Belinda to come forward for our manifest suture. What? Who had their hand up? Debbie. Debbie, Debbie Bender. Uh, I'd like to announce that last week I told you about the Salvation Army's Angel Tree program. It begins this week. We will have envelopes in the pews next week. Watch your email. We'll also have an announcement there, as well as we will be mailing out to those who don't come to church who are on Zoom or on YouTube. Thank you, Debbie. Any other announcements? Okay, Belinda. The Bible gives us examples of stewards or those who have stewardship over something. 
In Genesis, we see that Eliezer of Damascus is the steward for Abraham. Also in Genesis, we see that Joseph's steward carries out commands of testing Jew, uh, Joseph's brothers to see if, he's going, if they're going to lie again to his father. Also in Chronicle, First Chronicles, David called together a great assembly that included the, included the stewards that have oversight over everything that belonged to the king and his sons. From these references, we see that stewards were entrusted by their masters to oversee all that the master had. So as stewards of God, we are to be the people that can be trusted to care for things that are important to our master, God Almighty. As believers, stewardship of our possessions, time, and talent shows the importance we place on sharing what God has given to us to share with others. Last week, we heard what the deacons, the fellowship, and the reach out committee is doing to honor their commitment to God. And I think that really heartened all of us, at least it heartened me, because we were reminded of many wonderful things that are happening here in our church. Surely, we all know that COVID has given all churches and all groups a real run for their money but we work to still to be obedient stewards. As a Christian ed committee, we are struggling with where have all the children gone? But we continue to reach out, we continue to plan events, and we continue serving with our time and our talents. For example, as Bob just said, we have adult, he teaches adult Sunday school every morning in the lounge at 845. He teaches a Monday night, a Tuesday morning, and a Thursday morning Bible study over Zoom. And I think people can come in too, right? Becca is teaching Sunday school with our youth from 950 to 1020, where they survey and look at what Pastor Bob's going to teach about in that scripture, and then they come in for the sermon. Becca also has Sunday night youth group, scavenger hunts, retreats, and outings. And actually there are some openings for kids to go to the Kennywood uh, outing later in October. So if somebody wants to go, just contact the church or Becca. She also reads every Wednesday to the, to the little kids in our daycare as a reach out kind of tool. Christian Ed was also able to host Bible school this year and summer's best two weeks, I'm glad to say, has been able to return. We will continue to reach out to our youth. We will continue to study the gospel together and we will continue to plan events. We invite you all, everyone here, to come alongside in exercising faith through stewardship and demonstrating love for God and our neighbor. Thank you. What joys and concerns do we would we like to share? Please wait for the microphone that Bob Hornyak will bring forward. We want to keep a Dick Snyder in our prayers. He had COVID uh, and he uh, is back home and so he's doing better. So we want to definitely keep him in our prayers. Any others? Yes, go ahead, Donna. Lewis is doing a lot better. Oh, she got one there. Go ahead. Uh, Lewis is doing a lot better. He's out, he's in the rehab center and he's starting to get used to his um, arm and his, and his speech coming back. And I think that Mr. Uh, Schaefer, is, Ray Walter said he is doing better too, but he's still in the hospital and he's still on the ventilator. Thank you. Just one. Yep. Um, 
Uh, many of you know that in the last several weeks I've been dealing with health issue. Um, on uh, September 22nd, I had surgery on my lung, uh, and what was removed was uh, melanoma. So I'm going to be entering into a clinical study uh, for immunotherapy late in November, which will hopefully treat any future melanoma. So immunotherapy is uh, an option to chemo or radiation. So please continue to keep me in your prayers. Just wanted to give you an update. And thank you all so much for your concern and your cards. Thank you, Donna. Any others? Uh, Cindy Hawk, who broke her, uh, her leg, she's getting better. She's out of her cast and into a walking boot, right? Uh, anyone else? Then let us center ourselves on the worship of God. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let us join together in our responsive to the call of worship. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I for I walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wa wavering. Prove me, prove me, O prove me, O Lord, and okay, and try to try me. Test my heart and my and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. Proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all of your wondrous deeds. O oh Lord, I love habitation of your house and your place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men. In those in those hands are evil devices, and and uh, those right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the great assembly. I will bless the Lord. Let us worship God. Go ahead, Scott. Good morning. Good morning. You have the video? Okay. 
So we're going to sing of our love forever for our Lord. Open your hearts and your minds this morning. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing when your love came down. a lot to be thankful for this Sunday morning. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up your heart, let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing when your love came down. Sing of your love forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go and let's go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. Lord of forgiveness and mercy. We rejoice that you are able to render relationship. However, we continue to sin and fall short of your plans for us. We ask that you continue to redeem us and empower us through your Holy Spirit to live our lives in righteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Christian friends, we can despair when we continue to sin and wonder, oh Lord, why can't you take this away from me? But at the same time, in that prayer, in that lament, God gives us comfort, he gives us his presence, and he gives us the ability to turn away from what we're doing and turn towards his righteousness. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let's remain standing and affirm what we believe by sharing together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray that, that God will open our hearts and our minds. Lord God, open our eyes that we are so often shut. Open our ears that we are so often closed. And open our hearts that are so often cold. And finally, finally give our minds that, so that we can see, see, hear, feel, and know your wondrous world of word of life and share it with with those, uh, with those that we know and love. In, in the name of Jesus, amen. Our first lesson today, it comes from the reading of Romans chapter three, verses 21 through 31. But now the righteousness of God have manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ who, for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all who have sinned and fell short of glory, glory of God, and are justified by his grace as the gift through the redemption in, that, Jesus, in, that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood and to be, to be received by faith. This was, this was to show God righteousness because his divine for, forbearance and had passed over former sins. This, it is shown to his righteousness at this present time so that he might be just the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting is excluded by, the, by, the, by what kind of law, by what kind of works? No, by what kind of laws of faith? For we hold that one is justified in, by faith apart from works, and in law for or God is God is the God of Jews only. It is not only God uh, gods of Gentiles. It Gentiles also yes ge, yes of Gentiles, since God is one who will justify the circumcised the circumcised and by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. Do we not overflow the laws of, by this faith? By no means. Our contra contrary, we uphold the law. May the Lord bless this reading as we understand stand, stand of his holy word.
Thank you, choir. Our scripture today, and I want to, I, those who are in Bible study, you're going to hear some of the same stuff because we're going through this exact uh, passages in Bible study, but our Bible study today, or our pa uh, scripture passage today, comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through uh, 13. It talks about the origin of sin in the world. So hear these words. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and, then it was a, and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, my sermon title is a good example of, of uh, a work in progress title. I don't know where I was going with the septic tank versus cesspool. What's the difference? I don't really know where I was going with that. Uh, but that's not the direction I went. So we went another direction. But it is interesting to thinking about what is the difference between the two of them. Let's move on. But our passage today really talks about how sin enters the world and how it began to corrupt all aspects of God's good creation, including our ability to be in a relationship with God as we blame everyone for our falling. However, God in Christ provides the cure so that his creation is restored and our relationships are redeemed. And this is really a two-part sermon series where we'll go into the cure more next week. Okay? Uh, so when you think about good versus evil... The first thing you got to know what's good is. You know, and we talked a little bit about that last week. What is good? What's the de definition of good? Jesus says, don't call me good. Only God in heaven is good. So we really need to talk about good versus bad. This thing is a good thing to do. That is a bad thing to do. And so that is really the whole concept that we, we talk about in the fall. Because the fall of man is about how bad enters the world. Where did it come from? Where did it originate? You know, because we see day by day by day by day, God ends the day, there was morning, there was evening, and it was good. God said it was good. So if God's saying it's good, we've got to admit it must be good. But suddenly something bad happens. And we see that when bad happens, we get in a heap of trouble. You know, there is, things can happen. I remember in seminary, there's this one uh, uh, single father, and he was always late to everything, Thad, and he would literally tell his children as he's gathering them up to get them to school, he says, if we don't get, if we don't get moving, we're going to be in a heap of trouble. And they said, Dad, what does a heap of trouble look like? He says, don't make me show you especially when they were a little hesitant in getting their things together. And we've all been in a heap of trouble one time or another, I'm sure. 
But our story today talks about the fall of man and the devastation sin has on the world, on us individually, us as a community, us in our relationships, our relationship between, between ourselves and God, and our relationships between ourselves and uh, others. So again, how did it get here? Who created it? It's easy to think that, oh, it must have been God because God created everything, but that would be going a step too far because God did not enter, uh, bring sin into the world. In fact, God said at the end of Genesis uh, chapter 1, saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was not just good, but very good. So at the end of the sixth day before God rested, he had pronounced it is very good. And then we move into Genesis chapter 2. And I think we talked a little bit about last week that Genesis chapter 2 is about the micro version of creation. And everything at the end of that is husband and wife, and that was great. That was two weeks ago. But then we go into Genesis chapter 3, and it begins with, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, Actually, in the English Standard Version, it says, Did God actually say, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, that's interesting. Is that what God said? If we look back into Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, what God did say is, You may eat of any tree of the garden, except for. So it brings into mind the serpent, and again, I asked someone in Bible study, when you think of the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, do you think of Satan? And, and most people said, yeah. And you can make an argument, well, you definitely can make an argument that in the book of Hebrews, it does refer almost directly that, the, that Satan was in the garden as a serpent. But that's like the only reference. And we'll get to that connection a little bit later, but we have to, at least at this point, not make a connection there. Because we can't always revert to, the devil made me do it. We have to recognize, as it said in our uh, first passage from Romans, that we bring sin upon ourselves. But let's go for a moment to that, what the serpent said. Did God really say? Did God actually say? So what did the serpent do? If God said, you can eat of any tree of the garden, and the serpent says, did God actually say you can't eat of any tree? He actually distorted God's word. That's the first lie. That's the first distortion, and we don't even know the motivation behind that. It was like, did God say that? Why would even the serpent question what God said? Is, was it hearsay? Was he thinking, I heard from what he heard from? Or was he try, did, what was his motivation? Someone in our Bible study said maybe he wanted to be in charge, to be the top beast in the, in the garden rather than man or woman. We do not know what, what the lie was, but we know that lies are interesting. The closer to the truth, the better the lie, and the truth itself, when it can be used, is the best lie. You know, manipulation can happen in almost any way. We can say things that are true in such a way that people move from one direction into another. That's what, in many ways, political statistics are all about, to shift you from one direction to another direction. And here the serpent was shifting in this lie, this very subtle lie, Adam and Eve from one direction of obedience to another direction of disobedience. And it continues, Eve responds. Of course we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Okay, so the woman responds. We don't quite know why Adam didn't respond. But let's, let's hold off. But the woman is the one responding. So now we know what are the trees in the middle of the garden. We have the tree of life, and we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
So these two trees are what's there. So we don't suspect that, we don't know that, we know she's not referring to the tree of life because that's one of the other trees of any tree that can be eaten, but God specifically said, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. But was there something different in what Eve said versus what God said? Again, it sounds similar. And where did she get it? Where did she hear it? Because as someone pointed out, Eve wasn't even created yet. So by all accounts, it must be hearsay. She must have heard it from either God or she must have heard it from Adam. We're pretty sure it's not God because God doesn't change and suddenly God changed. In seemingly a very short period of time, he tells Adam, he says, don't eat of it. And then he tells Eve, oops, oh, I forgot, don't touch it either. And if that was true, don't you think that would have been in Scripture? But it's not. So we can almost cross out the concept that God told her. So we know that Adam told her. But what did Adam say? You know, have you heard the expression, I'm only responsible for what I say, not for what you understand? Okay, that's all nice. But sometimes, do we know what we say? And are we saying it clearly? I know one of the issues I have um, in my speech is because I had some, you know, verbal dyslexia, that sometimes I will, in my confusion, unless I'm very slow and deliberate, I will say one thing as opposed to another thing, and the words can be very similar. And I know I, I want to happen this when people, many in this congregation, look at me and go, what? You know, and then I've got to say, okay, what am I saying? So again, I can say something with an intent to mean one thing, but something else might come across. And let's say what is the scripture testimony is that we will say things, God will tell us something, this is what I command you to do, and then, then we will say, we'll add to it. And we'll create a fence around it. Something to say, okay, we don't want to do this, so let's not do that. It's like we don't want to put something on the communion table, so tell you what, members of the congregation, don't even come up on the platform. Because if you don't come up on the platform, then you won't be touching the communion table. And tell you what, you might forget that, so why don't you just not come into the sanctuary at all? So fence after fence after fence can be created. And I think if we really look at it, that's what Adam was doing in what he told Eve. But the possibility is that Eve just came up with it. Hey, you know, let me just come up with something totally out of the blue. But we know it happened. And we don't know which is which. I mean, if you look at Scripture, it's not clear how that miscommunication, because God says you can't eat of the tree. He said nothing about not touching it. But that's what Eve communicates. You can't eat it or touch it. But we don't know how that came to be. So Genesis 3, 4 through 5 continues, and the serpent said to the woman, you want to keep track of these four things. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, one, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, two, you will be like God, three, and you'll know good and evil, four. It's important to keep track of these four things. Okay, so this is what the serpent said. Now, I don't take that, I mean, I don't take that as incredibly convincing. When I was in college, I was on the debate team, and I got to admit, that would not have convinced me to go from, dis from obedience to disobedience. But apparently, the serpent was a talker. Because these four things were promises that the serpent had made to Eve. You know, you won't die, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, and you know good and evil. But these were in many ways a pie crust promise. The serpent might have said this, but these are going to be easily broken as well, because we see that they are. We see that at least one is a deception. So we continue to ask, where in the heck is Adam? Why isn't Adam bucking up right now and saying, wait a minute, why are, we t why are you talking to my wife? Is he on the North 40 plowing? Is he taking a nap? What is he doing? Where is he at? Well, we'll get to that later. 
hold on to that thought. So it continues, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So I guess the mystery in many ways is solved. Adam wasn't anywhere else. Adam was right there. So in that regard, we suspect that that is what Adam told her because if it hadn't been, he probably would have piped up and says, oh, wait a minute, hon. That's not what I said, God said. You're getting a little wrong. But he says nothing. And, and, and that begins that process of moving in that wrong direction. So, you know, ignoring signs is a good way to end up in the wrong direction. And the first sign is that when the serpent was talking to the woman, Adam should have stepped in and says, why are we having this conversation at all? Sign number one, that it shouldn't have happened. And then when Eve makes a, the mistake of speaking the way she does, wait a minute, if it was a mistake, that's not what he said, but then Adam should have corrected himself and says, you know, that's what I'm saying, that's not what God said. Adam ignored a problem here. Eve ignored a problem. But ignoring problems doesn't solve the problem. They were ignoring the fact that God had given them clear direction and that despite what the serpent was saying, for whatever motivation the serpent had, they were moving in that direction. And so the first sin, and we discussed this, wasn't the first sin of omission, and I give full credit to Rich Mills, she, he used that word, that Adam wasn't holding fast. Remember the sermon we had about holding fast? Adam was not holding fast. He was letting go. And let an Eve just go off in a direction and then lead him in that direction, which would have been disobedience, so a sin of a mission of disobedience, just as Eve taking that first bite of the fruit was disobedience as well, and then Adam following suit. It seemed like they both wanted to jump knee-deep headfirst into sin. They were saying, the heck with what God said. Let's get it all done. Let's figure it out. Let's just do what we want and not what God has told us. And so we see, the, we see what happens. They eat the, fr eat the fruit, and then what happens? The eyes of both were open. They knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Their eyes were wide open. Now, this is not the concept of knowing good and evil. It means the loss of innocence, the loss of naivete. Almost that shift we have as a young person going into an old person, that for an older person, the first time when we have to pay a car payment all on our own. What do you mean I got to pay excellent hundreds of dollars for my car every month for five years? And then getting your first apartment, what do you mean i got to pay hundreds of dollars for my apartment? Plus utilities. Plus, you mean i got to buy my own soap? So that movement from that eye shut as a young person, a child, to the eyes wide open was a shift. And what did they do? They, put, they realized we're not dressed. We are sort of like a little too transparent, so they sewed fig leaves together. I don't know if any of you, but I love Project Runway. But I have yet to see them. I know Mike, you know, he talks about baseball all the time, and, he, and I never shake my head. So, but he doesn't allow me to talk to Project Runway with him. I don't know what that's about. But anyway, I'm yet to see them take fig leaves and make a dress that is something you could wear over a period of time. But apparently that's what they did. They made fig leaves to cover themselves. Because they realized, again, in their openness that, wait a minute, we don't have any clothes on. Seeing the difference between men and women, seeing the difference between transparency and something else. And then what did it do? They hid. You know, you can run with a lie, but you can't hide from the truth. It will catch you. It will come back. You can think that you can lie. You can think you can deceive, but it always comes back. 
And so they hid themselves in among the trees of the garden, thinking that God's not going to see them through all the trees in the way. But God, we can't hide from God. And we have to recognize that if we have nothing to hide, there's no reason not to be transparent. There's nothing to hide, nothing to prove, nothing to fear, nothing to lose. If we are open, then we don't have to worry about concealing. And that's immediately, from their eyes being open, they ran and sought to conceal themselves they, because they knew something wasn't right. But God said, called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So now we see a cause and effect. God says, come out, come out wherever you are. And Adam and Eve are running scared. They knew that revealing themselves would show God that something was wrong. There's a psalm that says, I, you know, Lord, you know me more fully than, than anything. Where can I go outside your presence? I can go to the depth of Sheol, you're there. If I go to the heights of heaven, you're there. Wherever I go, you are there. Because when God calls us, and our spiritual phone starts ringing, we might not want to answer, but guess what? The phone keeps on ringing. And it gets louder and louder, and louder. Now, Adam says, God, I hid myself because I was naked. I have nothing to wear. I only had this old fig leaf outfit that I just made. Do we hear God's calling to us? And is one of the reasons we don't answer is because we are afraid of what we're wearing? that we don't want to be transparent for, before God, even though we are. God sees past our clothing. He sees our heart. A British poet said that you're no one's properly dressed with it unless he wears a smile. When God calls, do we wear a smile? Do we know that that is what God's looking for? He's looking for an open heart or an obedient heart. Or do we try to put on outfits and airs and things around us that make the world think, the world may say, wow, what a righteous person, what a great person. But we know that what we're wearing is pretty clumsy, pretty bad fitting. And we don't want to show God. Now God, here's what Adam says, and he says, who told you that you were naked? And then he makes a logical connection. Wait a minute. Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? You should not eat? He makes that connection. That apparently the, the understanding of the loss of transparency connects with knowing there's good and there's evil. So Adam knows he's caught. And so Adam decides to buck up and be, you know, take full responsibility. He says, then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. I guess I got that last part wrong. He did not stand and take responsibility for what he was doing. What did he do? He passed the buck. God's going to figure it out. God figures everything out, so we can't lie to God. We think we can. We even think we can lie to other people. But did you know there is like a, a sense that all people have that they know when they're being lied to? It's almost like a superpower. All humans have. They know when they're hearing a lie. They might not know what the feeling is, but it really comes down to they know when they're hearing something that's off. That's why the best lie is the one closest to the truth. But God even sees past the little small lies, the white lies, the petty lies. And so he demands an explanation from us. What do you have to say for yourself? And this is where all of us have a decision to make. Do we stand and admit what we've done and say, yes, it was me? Or we do, do we do something else? Do we throw others under the bus? Now, who did he throw under the bus? Everyone says he's Eve, the woman. But wait a minute, who else did he throw under the bus? The woman who you gave to be with me. 
How often do we blame God for all our troubles? We do that so constantly. I don't go to church because something really bad happened to me that I caused and God didn't prevent it. It must be God's fault. But most of our tragedies in our life are self-inflicted, if not inflicted by us, inflicted by someone else and not God. God is not a good luck charm. But we want to shift the blame and not take responsibility. But when we do that, we deny ourselves the opportunity to learn and grow in God's eyes. And on our own, we sort of avoid that, which is not good. So after throwing both God and the woman under the bus, God goes to the woman and says, what is this you've done in the woman? doesn't do any better. The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the woman throws the serpent under the bus. If you're unhappy and you know it, shift the blame. It's always good to just shift it. You don't have to take responsibility for yourself, but in the reality, you do have to take responsibility for yourself. And the question really is not that the devil made me do it, but why did I do it? What's the deception? We have to ask ourselves, what was the deception? that was involved in what the serpent did. If we look at, it said, your eyes will be open. Go to the next one, would you, Ken? Next one. Oh, okay. Were they dead? No. Were their eyes opened? Literally says that in scripture. Did they now know good from evil? Yes. Because God said, is this, did you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil when they realized they were naked? So lastly, the deception was to be like God. When the serpent says, you'll be like God, eh, that's a deception. Because the reality is God is God. We, I say that a lot, and I'll say it again, and we're not. That can never, ever happen. God is always God. We are finite, limited, falling sinners making fallible mistakes. That's us. That identifies us. Even after knowing Christ, even after we accept Christ as our Savior, we are still finite, limited, fallen sinners making fallible mistakes. But God remains God. And God is God alone. There's no other gods. And God is good. As, as Jesus himself said, God is good. So we look to God for, at all times, even when things are bad. Because God, what? God is love. God loves us. And God is seeking that relationship with us. We have broken relationship with him, but he, he wants relationship with us. We have broken relationship with each other between husbands and wives, between friends and family, between all aspects of relationship because of our sin. We want what we want when we want it, and sin has entered the world, and now that causes conflict among all of us. Next week, we'll look at the more expanded understanding of how that impacted husbands and wives, men and women in all relationships. But the reality we, we leave with today is that God, despite our sinfulness, and him withholding the consequence of death, God wants relationship despite our sin. And that we can take great joy. Because despite our sinfulness and the fact that we fall short, God lifts us up and holds us tight. In his holy name, amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we ask your blessings on us today. We ask you to be with Dick Snyder, who is recovering from COVID. Be with him. Give him your strength and your presence. Lord, be with Janet Medved, who does not have breast cancer, who's had a biopsy and it came back clean, and we rejoice in that. With Kathy Lose as she struggles with family issues and health, with Donna, who 
is recovering from her uh, surgery. We ask that the study that she is, enters in for treatment is successful and that she is able to uh, completely recover from what she is uh, dealing with now. We ask your blessings on Brenda Harris's brother-in-law, Lewis, who had a stroke. He's doing better. On Chad Schaefer, uh, a T part of the teaching staff at uh, Cornerstone uh, Wilson Christian Academy, that he's uh, doing better with COVID. On Joe and Katie Ferringer, uh, Joe and Katie Cermak, who had their vow renewed yesterday. We ask your blessings on Carol Spiker, who's doing a lot better and hopefully will come to visit us soon. With Tom Kressel, Annie and Patty's brother-in-law. With Joyce Weber's uh, mother, Virginia, and John Weber. With Claire Starkey, Lori Broadwater's mom, and Pat uh, Nickel, with her health issues and all the people she's lost. Lord, be with Cindy Hawk as she continues to recover and be with all of us as we seek to deal with the, the conflict that's in our country with the border crisis and politics and all that. Just be with us. Help us to look beyond ourselves and look to you in all things. Lord, we thank you for your love and your presence, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, it's right and proper that we return a portion of what God's given to us. So we have offering baskets in the back. For those on Zoom and YouTube, uh, please send your offerings in. And so as we gather together as a community, we seek to share within our community, larger community, the love of Jesus Christ. So let us commit these gifts to that purpose. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these gifts, for the people that gave them out of a, a prayerful, sacrificial, and faithful heart. Let us be cheerful in our giving, and let us always seek to serve you in our giving, as you have so much served us as our God and Savior. We ask this all in your Son's holy name. Amen.
Christian friends, I, let's have a, when I do the benediction, we'll have a prayer for the food. I invite you to stay for Oktoberfest and have a, a time of uh, in enjoying this great food and uh, chatting together and fellowship together. As we leave this place, let us know that we leave as sinners. But we also leave redeemed in Jesus Christ. Because God loves us so much. He is a God of love. And in that, we can share with the world. Now, Lord, we ask your blessings on us as we leave, knowing that we enjoy, we'll enjoy a time of fellowship. And just give us your strength and your presence and give us your love. We ask in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.